Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope, that the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, stagnancy, ignorance. All of this let it depart from the tents of your holy people. And stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you in the ark of your greatness. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Arkadi in your divine arms, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. May the Lord bless you. You be seated. The place of Holy Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God into righteousness and holiness of truth. And the word that will be presented to you is taken from the series of sermons of Apostle Brother Arkadi, which is a challenge for all of those who have loved the word of the Lord. And this is the right to set aside the former way of life in order to be clothed into a new way of life. The right, the right, the right to anointing. The evangelist right, and they looked at his teaching for his word was with power. Now we understand that his word was with anointing. For he taught as one with power, not as the scribes and Pharisees. We again are met with this anointing. This is the anointing of a teacher in order to set aside the former way of life we have a fully different anointing the anointing of a student because the former way of life that is necessary to leave this is our character our vain life our genetics and all levels of our life which we must leave that we can be clothed or clothe our bodies into a new way of life so the right to set aside is the anointing for kings priests and prophets for those who will fulfill their calling the anointing is given to the teacher who teaches and to the disciple who is taught this anointing is different as we heard the outer garments of the teacher must become the mantle for the disciple. Christians throughout all time for 2,000 years had heard the sermons about the spirit and about the soul. And about the body, though, and its significance in the eyes of God. And the majority was has not yet been realized. And on Friday, we heard by Pastor Daniel that prophecies were not spoken by the will of men, but according to the will of God. They were spoken by the men of God or rather, by the apostles. And we live in that time when God, as before, had placed prophets, apostles, who have the anointing in order to unseal this word so that we are able to enter into the fulfillment of our calling, which is found in the commandment. And for the fulfillment of this commandment, there are three faithful questions and three verbs this is to set aside, renew, and to clothe. And as we already know, these familiar verbs to us contain in themselves the great mystery of the revelations of God. 
they are not just dry, insignificant slogans. As the scribes and Pharisees would preach out, preach about without anointing, these would be slogans. However, despite the sequence of these verbs, it doesn't tell us how and what means to use in order to set aside the former way of life and then to renew our thinking and finally to begin the process of being clothed in our new man. And based on how we answer these three faithful questions will depend on whether or not we turn ourselves into vessels of mercy or vessels of wrath, or rather, will the salvation that was given to us in the format of a deposit be fulfilled, or will we waste it? If we were to waste it, our names would be blotted out of the book of life forever although at one point they were written in it. I want to remind you that a person who is not enlightened by the meaning of his calling, he tries to achieve his so-called calling how he understands and sees fit. And in doing so, he loses the fact that he needs to accept his calling on the conditions that is given by God. Salvation is not the goal of God for men. This sounds paradox perhaps for all of Christianity, but this is so. On one end, salvation is a gift. On the other end, salvation is, as you know, it's like when there is some kind of drowning ship, sinking ship, and he is thrown a, a life vest. And we will ask you, do you think he is saved or not? Well, on one hand, yes. And on the other hand, no. There is no land under his feet. He hasn't touched the sand yet, and therefore he still needs to collaborate with that salvation that has been given to him. In other words, salvation is the instrument thanks to which we must achieve other goals that have been placed by God, but a person doesn't see them. In a certain format, we have looked at the first two questions and have stopped to study the following question and not just looked at, but we have accepted in our heart, accepted. This means we set aside the formal way of life, set aside, and then we have renewed our thinking with the spirit of our mind, which is founded on completely different values and goals. And we have stopped to study the following question. What conditions ought we ought to we ought to fulfill so that through our renewed thinking, we could begin the process of clothing ourselves into the powers of our new man who is created by God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holiness of truth. And when examining the nature of the new man, we decided to look at the process of being clothed in the powers of the new man from seven different angles or in seven virtues, although, Pastor said, many more of them exist. Therefore, this is a person clothed in the garments of salvation. It is someone dressed in a row of of righteousness, someone crowned with the crown of the bridegroom, a person decorated with the ornaments of a bride, dressed in a wedding garment, it is a person dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, it is a person who accepted a representative force, Yahweh of hosts. When examining these virtues, we highlighted the fact that all of these virtues are located in one another, find themselves in one another, come from one another, support one another, and serve to ratify the truth of one another. In the book of Isaiah, we will discover each of uh, four of these virtues, which are written in sequence. Let us read it, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 10 through 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. First dignity. Second, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Third, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Number four. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. We should note that these virtues are meant for each person individu individually. We have noted that the combination in one person of these virtues and regalia of power, especially the combination of the crown of the bridegroom and jewels of the bride, 
truly surpasses the abilities of our mind. I will remind you that all of those that are found in Christ Jesus must have the male and the female function. For in Christ there is no male nor female gender. Second, in this prophetic saying, there are virtues that are grown by God in the heart of a person. The same way the earth grows its plants and a garden grows what is sown in it. A heart of a person grows. This means that the heart represents the soil that is called to grow this virtue. Third, joy in the Lord in this prophecy is one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit that is called to define the kingdom of heaven in the pure heart of man. And it is the heart of man that must be good. This is important to know that a good heart is a heart that prepares itself for hearing and to immediate fulfillment of that which it hears. For a prepared soil is without tears, it's without rocks, it is not on the road. It is a good soil it is good soil that is involved with praying and pondering upon the word. I will provide an example. In this world, those people, farmers that work without preparing the land will never sow anything because they cherish that which they have. They cherish the seed that they have. We know and before I didn't know, but now we heard that Russia and Ukraine are the biggest manufacturer of minerals for many countries in this world. And for Russia and for Ukraine, Belarus and the sanctions that were released, now these minerals did not end up in the European countries. And many farmers in this year did not sow their field because they figured that if they sow their field then they're going to lose their harvest three or four times over the people of this world they value this seed you know devil is not legitimate to proclaim any sanctions against us because we have prepared our soil so that we can accept the seed and sow it because we prepare this soil together. We are called to work with the soil and to prepare it in order to offer the fruit of joy. And this kind of fruit of joy is the result of harvest that yields the kingdom of heaven in the heart, ascending in power, which was previously in the sowing of an unfading seed that was planted in, tear, in tears in the heart of this man. As it is written in Psalms 126, verses 5-6, through six, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Here we see the big difference between the seed of the kingdom of heaven and the fruit that is grown from the seed. Upon sowing of tears, of course, this is in Gethsemane. This was also tears. Crucifixion, nails, this is also tears. And this is a very, this is a very tormenting pain. But there is also victory. There is also resurrection. There is a certain harvest, joy, victory, and of course, glory. And in this we have a mutual common fate. Therefore, being clothed into the new man is being clothed in the resurrection of Christ, in the subject of the fruit of the Spirit brought to us by God, that is called to yield in our heart the power and order of the kingdom of heaven in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In a certain format, we have already examined the core that is in the garments of salvation and have stopped to study the robes of righteousness, specifically the size of the price that is necessary to pay for the right to be clothed in a robe of righteousness, which clothes us in the powers to be fulfillers of the judgments of God. We have already looked at six conditions and have stopped to study the seventh condition, and this is being clothed in the redemption that is due to being observant of the Lord's Pesach according to the statutes set by God. And we will read this place of scripture written in John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58. I think you know that no one 
the fact that there are chapters and verses, this was not written in the original text. The chapter and verses, they're not perfect because sometimes they sometimes they separate an important, uh, important meaning that should continues on in the next chapter. But let's read John chapter 6, 53 to 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will die forever. This place of scripture is a commandment for us, and any kind of commandment works according to the measure of its acknowledgement. The more we know a commandment, the greater it works in us. If we understand that here we are talking about the truth of the blood of Christ and the truth of the cross of Christ, and if we can understand this teaching, then in that level, or that measure in which we understand it, or rather we'll acknowledge it and are united with it, in that same level we will be able to clothe, to be clothed into our redemption. The main purpose and the worthy partaking of the Pesach is comprised of the knowledge through instruction and faith our work with the teaching contained in the truth of the blood of Christ and in the truth of the cross of Christ, revealing for us a path to inheritance in the blood of Christ. If a person, through instruction and faith, will not be taught these two fundamental truths, or these two disciplines, we hear and we are immersed in them continually. They are the root system of the teaching of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh then we will not have the opportunity to worthy partake in the Feast of the Lord. In the Pesach statute, worthy partaking with the Pesach lamb consisted of meeting the condition of certain kinds of clothing that carry the readiness to fulfill God's justice and certain kinds of conditions necessary for worthy partaking of the Pesach lamb. Non-compliance to these conditions in any of their aspects did not free man from execution of the sentence of death. For the retribution for sin is death, and we should remember that this is the justice of God. And on the contrary, complying to the statutes of the Pesach made a person a partaker to the production of God's judgment over the firstborn of Egypt. Let us read Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. For I will pass, pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. A memorial is not a day in the calendar. This kind of day must be continually found in our mind, or rather the teaching of Jesus Christ in the blood, what it does, what it produces in our life. And when we know and we remember that the blood cleanses us from all kinds of curse and it carries the life of Jesus, and when we have this, John says that death will pass us. And as it says, I will see the blood and I will pass over you. According to these regulations, we know that the firstborn of Egypt that the Egyptians so heavily relied on were the deities and the gods of Egypt. Who or what we are dependent on defines our deities, our trust, and our worship. 
And so the firstborn of Egypt represented an image of the soul of a man who declined to lose his soul in the death of the Lord Jesus. We should remember that those who lost their soul in the death of the Lord Jesus, they, in doing so, they condemned the firstborn of Egypt. And those who voluntarily refused to lose their soul in the death of the Lord Jesus, that they can die to their nation, to their household, and to their carnal desires and preferences that went against the desires of God. They are the firstborn of Egypt. Or rather, if we do not fulfill God's justice by condemning our soul to death in the worthy partaking of the Lord's Pesach according to the statutes set in place by God, we will never be a part of the descendants of Abraham's faith. Additionally, we will never be able to be clothed in the robe of righteousness in the face of our new and innermost man. We know that Abraham, who was set by God as a standard of faith, accepted the promise of God in the seed of the preached word, and he began calling it inexistent as existent, and in this manner grew the seed into fruit of joy in the face of the one whom he bore, Isaac. Isaac is joy. As a long-desired fruit, the fruit of joy and gladness. How did he grow it? This is because he looked upon the invisible as visible. This quality, or this is the sign of the character traits of our Lord, to look at the invisible as the vis- as it was visible. The Word of God defines faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and things not seen. This is the victory of the spiritual eyes over the physical eyes. Physical eyes are found in close relations with our uncircumcised soul. Until I touch it, until I see it, you can't prove it to me, I won't receive it. But this is not our portion. Our portion is based on the Word of God and the information that we hear from the man of God and to look after we hear these words with the eyes of our heart. For the unfading riches of the Pesach feast to become our inheritance, Scripture imputed for us the necessity to fulfill ten conditions, or rather, to dwell in these ten conditions continually. And so, this is to choose and separate the Pesach lamb. This is to remove all leaven from our homes, to sprinkle the blood of the Pesach lamb over the beams and doorposts. This is to bake the whole Pesach lamb over fire. This is to gird ourselves with the belt. This is the belt or sash of truth. This means to have renewed thinking, to put shoes on our feet, to be a light to this world. Contain a staff in our hand. This is an image of our lost and then regained soul. It's a complete different kind of proclamation. We proclaim that which we see in God. To eat the whole lamb, so to not choose what we like and what we and take that for ourselves, but to eat the whole lamb. It is to eat the basic lamb with unlimited breads and bitter herbs, and it is to eat the basic lamb in haste. In the previous sermons, we have already examined nine conditions, and we have stopped to examine the triumphant condition in which God's redemption in man was called to triumph over sin and death. This is to eat the basic lamb in haste. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. We know that the word haste, aside from its literal meaning, in the dimension of time, means hurry, rush, not be late. In Hebrew, in the dimension of the Spirit, it contains a completely different meaning. Specifically, to haste is to take on the yoke, to carry your cross, to endure suffering, be clothed in the robe of a student, be clothed in weapons of light and the powers of the doctrine of Christ, or be strengthened with all power according to the might of God's glory. It is to renew your thinking, to meditate on the supreme law, to listen to the words of God with fear and trembling, and to stand on guard, not damaging the word of God. 
considering that eating the Pesach is a guarantee of the new law which is symbolically made in the number 8, number 8, the number of the covenant, we decided to look at 8 signs that contain the meaning of haste, although many more exist. In a certain format, we have already examined six signs, and we will look at the seventh sign. To eat the Pesach of the Lord in haste is to be strengthened with all power according to the might of God's glory, with all patience, long-suffering, and joy. Yes, Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. And we have noted that in Scripture, God's power that we are called to be strengthened by eating the Lord's Pesach in haste due to the innumerable possibilities of God are contained in a variety of His works that demonstrate the power and glory of God. Brother Arkady reminded us the word strength in Hebrew and what it means that this is the power, strength, might, right, authority, rule, sign, covenant, designation, light, the attributes of royal power, the whole armor of God, the host of heaven, elements of the universe, many graces and bounties of God, many of God's greatness and grandeur, many innumerable and immeasurable powers of God, power and fortresses, the ability and opportunity to do justice and righteousness, the ability to spread and expand miracles and wonders. And we know that this is not a full list of definitions. And only when collaborating with the specific and powers of God or strength of God that we understand that we could give room to move in us and through us, we are able to have evidence of the fact that we partake of the Pesach of the Lord in haste, giving us the opportunity to withstand the selfish ambitions of our personal Egypt and for this purpose we decided to look at what is to be understood as the powers of God contained in the power of his glory because without understanding the core of God's multitude of powers and being in patience and long-suffering with joy which in itself are the powers of God becomes not only useless for us but also irrational and impossible and so examining the first question, what is to be understood as the powers of God contained in the power of His glory? We have come to a conclusion that the multifunctional powers of God are defined by the immeasurable and innumerable manifold works of God. Psalms chapter 66 verse 3 Say to God, how awesome are your works! Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. This is for the enemies, but for us. The multifunctionality and the manifold powers of God contained in the power of God is revealed a great deed, God's redemption showing us who God is for us and what He has done for us. And the question, how can we be strengthened by the great powers of God? It reveals for us what we must do to inherit all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And so in a certain format, we have already examined several definitions that yield the nature and character of specific powers of God produced in His people and through His people. Provided that we are collaborating with these definitions. We have stopped at the next power of God that is called to be expressed in the heart of and through the heart of a person. This is according to the multitude of mercies and bounties of God. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. The multitude of the powers of God are presented in the multitude of his per, uh, mercies. We have noted that through these multiple powers of God expressed in the multitude of his mercies to enter into the house of God, when we understand what mercy is, we will understand one of the definitions of the power of God. And when we understand the multitude of the mercies of God, we will be able to acknowledge the multitude of the powers of God. Because this we will be able to enter to the house of God only through the mercy of God. Therefore, it is necessary for our heart to gain the right 
to not just collaborate with these demons, but also the right to dwell in these powers. In this right, to rule over and be in the powers of God, expressed in the multitude of God's mercies, is the fear of the Lord that is yielded by God's wisdom, which dwells in our mind, which dwells in us in the dignity of the mind of Christ, which in the virtue of a commander is called to tap into and lead all of these manifold powers to blot out our iniquities before the face of God and clothe us into his pure joy. And so Psalms 51 verses 3 through 14. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me, Hold you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. I do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressions, transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. These prayer words ought not just to be in our lips, but also in our spirit. This is the God program of God and this is also what we are enduring these words reflect what is going on in us we know that in order to blot out our iniquities we must cooperate with the multitude of the powers of God and the subject of his mercies containing the inheritance of the blood of the cross of Christ the mercies of God are the riches of the inheritance of the blood of Christ and our unique collaboration with the multitude of God's mercies expressed in his innumerable bounties created a prayer that defines the haste needed to eat of the Pesach. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. To cooperate with the manifold mercies of God that close us in the powers of God's perfect justice, it is necessary for mercy and truth to bind our necks so that these virtues could be written on the tablets of our heart. Let not mercy and truth forsake you, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 3 through 4. We have noted that under the image of a neck, which is a symbol, we are called to bind to mercy and truth, is our collaboration with the sovereign and perfect will of God. In practice, this means that my will is my neck. Wherever I turn, there I will go. There I will look at. This is my own opinion. Now it's important to say, or rather, some say this is democratic, but God is not democratic. His makeup and his order is also found in strict hierarchical subordination. And we know that God himself is going to depend on his spoken word. Because mercy and truth, the sovereign, perfect will of God for my neck. Therefore, whatever you turn, whatever you look at, agree with, you will go in that direction. You agree with the will of God that is perfect and sovereign if this will be possible if I bind my neck with them. Scripture or pastor says that this is to submit our will to the perfect will of God on the conditions that are outlined in Scripture. This is the collaboration of my will with the will of God. 
God commands us on His end and we, of course, fulfill. Whereas engraving mercy and truth on the tablet of our hearts is the cooperation of our wise and rational heart with the wisdom and mind of God. And a wise heart is specifically that heart which prepares itself for hearing the word of God before it goes to service. Therefore, which in practice means that each time when it is time for us to honor the Sabbath in our participation in the worship of His holy congregation, which we are members of, it is necessary to prepare the soul of our heart to receive the seed of the gospel word of the kingdom of heaven or to accept the water that waters the seed that has already grown. Exodus 31, 6 And I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans. They may make all that I have commanded you. Foolishness is that this person has not prepared his heart to hearing the word of the Lord. And God, seeing this, will never place his wisdom in the heart of this person. In this case, a wise heart is one that is in the boundaries of the legal framework of truth and prepares its heart to hear the preached word of the kingdom of heaven so that he can immediately fulfill it. And not just in one ear and out the other. When it goes in, we must hold it in and we must repeat it. Look into this word and in this manner, it will be in a completely, end up in a completely different place. And so, wise is that heart which in the legal framework of truth prepares itself for hearing the preached word about the kingdom of heaven in order to immediately fulfill it. And so, the teaching about mercy expressed in God's redemption that we are called to bind around our neck can manifest itself only under the strict boundaries of the legal framework of truth yielded by the teaching of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh. Instead of some kind of created pseudo-religious images, as well as waste from our intellect, which has no right or the ability to comprehend mercy and truth in the transcendent word of God. In relation to this, we have once again decided to refresh our memories with these questions that are well known to us. First, what character does scripture put in the properties of God's mercies which are an expression of his great power, defining God's favor toward man in the image of his golden scepter. Second question, what purpose in our worship is called to fulfill the great powers of God in the subject of God's mercies? Third question, what price must we pay so that the multitude of God's mercies became our property and our state? And fourth, According to which results should we judge that God truly stretched out to us the multitude of His mercies in the image of His golden scepter that granted us His great powers? And when defining and identifying God's mercy shown by God in the multitude of His powers, we came to the following conclusion that, first, God's mercy as it is, is one of the main names of God as well as one of His character titles. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Second, the Lord's mercy is God's inheritance that is passed on solely to His children as the heirs of Abraham's faith, from one righteous kind to another righteous kind, from the Father to the Son. Third, the Lord's mercy, according to its status, is lifted up over life in the flesh because it is better than life in the flesh. This is what David says, your mercy is better than life. Fourth, the Lord's mercy is one of the diverse manifestations of the goodness of God expressed in His grace which has reigned in the heart of a person through righteousness that a person has accepted as a gift of grace in the redemption of Christ Jesus. He did not earn it, he accepted it as a gift. If the Lord's mercy is one of the definitions and manifestations of God's truth that has been pre-designed for the vessels of mercy that walk in truth. 
Psalms 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. The concept of limits of the legal field of truth and justice in our heart gives God the opportunity to show the multitude of His mercies in our heart, which are seen as the manifold powers of God. Therefore, to receive the right to trumpet the manifold mercies of God, we can do only in the boundaries of the legal field of truth. We do not prepare our hearts to hear the proclaimed mercy in a legal field or framework of truth. We will not have the ability to turn God's favor upon us. Here's what Isaiah says in the lips of Apostle Paul about the church that is in Rome. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is Romans chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. In this word that was entrusted to the messengers of God, the means for accepting this kind of help expressed in the inheritance of God's mercies is prayer and worship. Because prayer is simply the right that man gives the heavens, the right that man gives the heavens to interfere here on earth. And we are called to give God this right only on His established conditions. And we should remember that it is not to us, but God that has given us this right and has entrusted it to us so that we could allow Him to partake in our life as well as the life of the whole earth. One of David's prayers written in the 143rd Psalm where he gives God the right to interfere in his life with His mercy and truth will be an example for us of our inheritance. And so, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications, in your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of the old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. And so... To be heard by God, it was necessary for David to present God a foundation or a right that could serve for God as proof that he could interfere in David's life with his mercy and truth. And from David's perspective, this kind of proof in this prayer contained ten different arguments that David brought to God, saying, Hear me, and so hear me because of your righteousness and truth, Hear me because I remember the days of the old and all of your works. Hear me because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me because I trust in you. Hear me because I lift my soul up to you. Hear me for I run to you. Hear me because you are my God. Hear me for your name. Hear me for your mercy. And hear me because I am your servant. In the previous sermon, we have already examined the first argument that gave God the legal right to stand on David's behalf to help him withstand his enemies. And to, and we have stopped to examine the second argument, evidence that David remembered the days of the old and all the works of God in these days. And 
On the tablets of his heart were written all the works of God which he made in the days of the old. And, of course, he mused on them. This is an important component of the truth, in that David dwelled in and that he brought to God in prayer as a certain argument, telling him, Hear me, because I remember the days of the old, and meditate on all your works, and muse on the work of your hands. We have arrived at the need to study the following questions. First, who or what by nature is a remembrance of God's works in the days of the old? Second, what purpose there is a remembrance of God's work in the days of the old called to fulfill? This is referring to the fact that we have engraved on the tablets of our heart and this commandment is our continual remembrance. Third, what price must we pay to remember God's works in the days of the old? And fourth, what results will follow after discovering in ourselves the remembrance of God's works in the days of the old? And so looking at the first question, what is remembrance of God's works, its properties, and its definitions? And we have come to the conclusion that remembrance is that storage or well of information and impressions that we received from the physical and spiritual dimension from our genetic lineage of our forefathers and the events of the past and present. I want to read some definitions given from a pastor that we heard a few years ago. And then in self-isolation, we had listened to it again. The topic of remembrance, this to me is a very important meeting. At the beginning of our service, we used to have questions that were asked of our pastor. And I was met with this the first time in my life when I saw that people wrote questions to pastor and the man behind the pulpit, pastor, he would open it and he would read. I was brought to astonishment that there was no intervention. Arkady opened the Word of God and he read, written. The, top, the questions were not based on some kind of topic, but like in war there are bullets flying, different kinds of questions. I thought, is there not going to be such a question that he couldn't answer? And this, I was so intrigued by this and so astonished that the memory remembrance was dedicated to something more important by him. And so, first, the memory of God is the informational program of God that yields the natural essence of God and his good goals that are shown by him in his works that are the programmable device, which is the good heart of a person that has been born from the unfading seed of the word of truth. The memory of God as an informational program of redemption shown in the chosen remnant of God figuratively is represented by Scripture as a living book of, mem of remembrance written inside and outside. The memory of a person also has its specific application. And here's a definition of the memory of a person. The memory of a person containing in itself the memory of God is the weapon of a person. And if he is deprived of such a memory, he will look as a destroyed city. This is Psalms 9-7. And from this we see that the weapon of the enemy is our unfaithful or our carnal fleshly memory. And behind this memory stands not the Lord. And therefore the weapon of God is the remembrance of the works of God that is the building material. Therefore, the ordinary human mind is based on certain events, or as we've noted, historical events. But for God, this is totally different. And uh, Brother Arkady had explained this one time, that we must remember that prophecies is information or the story uh, that is written in advance. This is a story of the future. The intellect is simply at rest here. This story differs from the story written by men after certain events had taken place. Someone writes a story leaning on facts and dates and with error. Therefore, uh, textbooks 
are oftentimes corrected. But God had once written the events, does not change them. They are without error across the whole planet, and they were strictly, was strictly written. Man cannot change these words. We are responsible for that which we engrave on the tablets of our heart and what is going to be our memory, for this is going to represent our essence and that in which we are going to be clothed in. And so according to scripture, the remembrance contained in a person defines the core of this person as well as his sovereign boundaries. Proverbs 23, 7 For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Considering that memory is information contained in the format of thoughts, it follows that if we keep on the tablets of our heart and proclaim before God His works in the days of the old, we are transformed into the image of thinking yielding the works of God, filled by Him in the days of the old. Which on our end is expressed in the right that we give God to interfere in our lives with His mercy. Otherwise, it doesn't work, as it is written. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And if this is in the heart, we will remember it. And when we remember it, the memory will allow our prayer to tri- to transfer into the memory of God because our memory will be equal to the memory of God. It's impossible to remember in our thoughts events that aren't in the informational well that is contained in our body cells or the tablet of our heart which is a keeper of information. And we will remember that when focusing on the power of our abilities that God placed in us at the moment of our creation We cannot keep in our heart the remembrance of God's deeds fulfilled by Him in the days of the old and simultaneously look at the works of humans. And so, by keeping in our heart a remembrance of God's works done by Him in the days of the old, in doing so, we erase from our memory the deeds of people and information that was passed down from the sinful life of our forefathers. We can say that it occurs, this occurs simultaneously. As soon as you begin writing on the tablets of your heart the remembrance of God's works, simultaneously you begin to blot out or to erase the memory that has been given to us from the vain life of our forefathers as well as the memory of man. And if a person tries to have two memories, divine and human, he will build the Babylonian tower. He, we can't. From one source can't flow bitter or sweet water. This tells us that when we engrave on the tablets of our heart that which God has done for us in our life, wherever we were felt, wherever we came from, a religious, religious swamp or another kind of swamp, and when he has, when he placed our feet on a rock that is higher than us, we remember what He has done for us, and thus we blot out from our the cells of our body the information that has been passed on from the vain life of our forefathers. This phenomenon. Those uh, scientists will never be able to explain this. And so, to keep in our memory a works of God is the decision, role, and responsibility of man. And so, to erase the remembrance of God's works in the heart of a person by focusing our eyes and thinking on the works of humans means to deprive a person of the right to eternal life and condemn him to death in the lake of fire. And each person decides on their own. The memory of a person is the weapon of man. 
And if we deprive his memory, he will look like a destroyed city. Again, let's read this by the scripture. O enemy, destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. The remembrance of God's works is inheritance of Christ that is passed down from one righteous nation to another. Psalms 102, verse 12. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever in the remembrance of your name to all generations. According to many sayings in Scripture, all of God's miracles made by Him in the days of the old are reminders because they reveal who God is for us and what He has done for us. Psalms 111 verse 4 He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. A remembrance of God's works in the heart of man is God's holiness in the subject of His unfading glory. Psalms 30 verse 4 Seek praise to the Lord, you saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holy name. The pastor gave us a definition that we are hallowed unto God in remembrance unto God. This means that we as precious in His eyes, all His saints are precious in His eyes, and we must remember of this. Studying the second question, what purpose in the relationship between God and His redeemed child is the remembrance of God's works in the days of the old called to fulfill and sealed on the tablets of our heart? We came to a conclusion that, first, one of the main purposes for the remembrance of God's works in relationship between God and His redeemed child serves on the tablets of our heart as the covenant of God with Abraham Isaac and Israel or Jacob Israel meaning warrior of prayer Exodus chapter 32 verse 13 remember Abraham Isaac and Israel your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever we know that we through the through Christ, have a right to this covenant. The next purpose of remembering God's works in the tablets of our heart is called to be the kind of place of worship on which God records the remembrance of His name. Exodus chapter 20, verse 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I record my name I will come to you and I will bless you. The remembrance of the name of the Lord is the Church of Jesus Christ. And we should realize what we are referring to. That's why we come to church on the territory which the hand of the Lord has outlined for the worship of His holy name and sacrifice. Here God is continually and not in the quality of a guest. This is us that must prepare ourselves to meet with the Lord with His word. And through the Holy Spirit it is going to enter into our heart bless us with understanding the word through wisdom and through healing and so forth. The third purpose of remembering God's works are the two precious onyx stones that were present on the shoulders of the ephod of the high priest. Exodus chapter 28 verses 9 through 12. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial. So ephod meaning on the shoulders. They shall be set as memorial stones for the stones of Israel, so Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. Exodus chapter 28 verses 9 through 12. The two precious onyx stones which were inserted in preparation for the settings of gold 
was present not only on the shoulders of the ephod of the high priest, but they were also inserted on the breastplate. At a time, onyx was as a decoration. It was also present in the garments of the fallen cherubim before his fall, in which he lost his virtue that was contained in the precious stones that adorned his garments. And as we will see later on, the two precious onyx stones with the engravings of the twelve sons of Israel on our heart will define God's law has been affirmed in our essence. And so, what are what is precious onyx? It differs from marble in its crystal structure. It is part of a rare category of stones that light is able to pass through and contains a wide color wheel. It also differs because of its fragility. It has many layers and figures which give it its unique beauty. A decoration, they are garments, outfit, splendor, honor, greatness, and beauty, glitter, grandeur, and glory. In this manner, the two precious onyx stones with an engraving on each one, six names of the tribes of Israel, placed in the golden settings on the two shoulders of the high priest, contain the meaning of two mountains, Gerizim and Dibal, in the subject of our calling, from the tops of which the twelve tribes of Israel ratified God's judgments in the format of blessings and curses. They affirmed, ratified His judgments. And so the image of these two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim, on the shoulders of the high priest and the subject of two carved onyx stones, with an engraving on each six names of the tribes of Israel and inserted into the golden settings represented, they represented an image of God's authority, which was yielded by God's perfect justice, expressed in blessings and in curses. Therefore, the golden settings in which were inserted two precious onyx stones is an image of truth and justice and the boundaries of which we were called to find the expression of blessings and curses. And the two chains out of pure gold, twisted like cords made of cunning work and attached to the golden settings is an image of God's grace expressed in the goodness and severity of God. Consider the dependence of the two golden settings on the two onyx stones that were cut out to fit these settings and placed in these settings. We note that in God's justice, that is a remembrance in our heart, we see the role of God that is made in two golden settings and in the two chains of pure gold. We also see the role of man in the two precious onyx stones carved to fit the golden settings with the twelve names, six names on each stone. In this manner, the two precious onyx stones on the shoulders of our heart gives God the right and opportunity to act and manifest His perfect judgment on planet Earth. And therefore, the role of God in the two gold settings and the two chains of gold on the shoulders of our heart is in the fact that He Himself represents His judgment and the revelation of His written word in the format of His severity toward those that have fallen away and in the format of His goodness towards those that keep themselves in the boundaries of His goodness. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fall severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. The role of man in the two precious onyx stones, with the carvings of the six names of the tribes of Israel on each of them, is in the fact that a man of God is called to carry out this judgment on the foundation of what he has heard in his heart through edification and faith. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. 
John 5.30. In this manner, the two golden settings representing God's true justice on the shoulders of our heart point to the image of the Son as well as the image of the Father, where the Son represents the judgment of His Father. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. John chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. So these two golden settings, or these two chains, represent not just the goodness and severity of God, but they also represent the Son and the Father, a double witness whereas the two precious onyx stones carved to fit the golden settings on the shoulders of our heart point to an image of two substances that are working together. This is the faith of God written on the tablets of our heart in the fate of the twelve names of the sons of Israel. In our tongue, which proclaims this faith in the correct moment in the boundaries of truth and righteousness. Pay attention to the fact that the role of God and the role of man are different. God is never going to fulfill our role for us, and a person always has the desire to fulfill the role of not just his own, but God's and all those that surround him. The twelve names of the sons of Jacob on the two precious onyx stones represent in the heart of man the order of the kingdom of heaven and the teaching of Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh. Let's remember, to ratify each blessing and each curse, the twelve tribes of Israel that stood on the heights of Mount Ebal and Gerizim bonded each blessing and each curse with the word, Amen. They read it and ratified it, and Pastor noted that it was this that had allowed God, after this kind of ratification, it allowed God to move through people on whose shoulders they were, there were such subjects. Again, ratification is the process of the ratification of a document, and shoulders is responsibility. And so, this is what allow God to move through people. For all? No. But only through those on whose shoulders was the responsibility expressed in these subjects and items. Remember, whom you heard about from the law of blessing and curse. First time, when you heard about the law of blessing and curse, how it works, what is blessing, and what is specifically a curse. Whoever says, we are Christians, we should not curse, they are those people that can't explain it, don't know what it is, and they are those that curse the most because they don't know the spiritual law. I think you've heard a lot of times from people the same thing. Usually people say, their pastor is cursing, and so we've heard this fable every child. They're not just ignorant in the word, these people that spread these rumors, they're ignorant in the word. If there are two soldiers standing side by side on their shoulders, we see them from far behind, they look the same, but when we look at the different shoulders, we see that these are more higher with regard, and the other soldiers' shoulders, what is on their shoulders is going to be in submission. In this example of subordination among the people of God, this destroys those that are churches of the democratic structure. And so, if we have these similar golden settings with two golden chains that are inserted to two precious onyx stones in the garments of our spirit with the engravings of the names of the twelve sons of Israel, then we are God's kings and priests who are called to be carriers of His remembrance, yielded in His perfect justice. Or for some, by the name of Christ will be an aroma of death leading to death, and for others, an aroma of life leading to life. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15-17 through 17, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. It was sufficient for these things, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. This kind of aroma will serve as evidence that we are eating of the basic lamb in haste, which serves not only for God but for us as a standard of everlasting evidence of our redemption. And I don't think that I will begin the next component because it is very broad and I think it's going to take up lots of time. When we talk about the breastplate, uh, the breastplate of judgment on the chest of the high priest, therefore I think I will stop here. Therefore, and next service is we will be immersed and we as warriors of prayer we will uh, proclaim not what we hear with our physical eyes but what our enlightened spirit sees that we can enter into the fulfillment of our calling and in doing so fulfilling the will of God for us and so that we are not quiet with our lips as David said when I was quiet therefore let us bow in prayer and thank God for the opportunity to know His will, know our calling, who God is for us, what He has done for us, how He views us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our just Father, in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are grateful to you that we can be found in this place, that we can have a trembling state because this place is holy and it has been outlined by your hand. We thank you for this, for this privilege and this opportunity to ponder upon your great words which have dug us out from the waterless pit. They have placed our feet on a firm foundation, have brought us up to heights higher than us, where you have made for us an immovable foundation which the works of devil are crushed by. You crush in this place all of his works. People receive deliverance. People restore their lives. You heal. You strengthen the weak. You give us wisdom and place wisdom in our heart. You give us understanding about what was done on the cross of Golgotha and what kind of victory we have entered in and how we ponder upon Hasek of the Lord rejoices that heart that has been made alive to God has begun to see the intention hate to begin to hate the intentions of man we thank you that you delivered each of us individually from the vain life of our fathers you delivered us from the law of sin and death destruction stagnation depression curses you have given us the opportunities to stand on a firm foundation to proclaim your words to be based on not what we see but that which we hear we are based on what we know I thank you for your man our brother Apostle Arkady and we Lord proclaim full healing for this person and we thank you that you have restored him, restored his strength, 
and have strengthened his health. May this man be blessed before you and all of his household. We thank you that thanks to this word that we have heard, all that was human we hated, but we have loved your law, and it for us has become a light. We thank you for the opportunity to submit ourselves to your word, which has become not a slogan, and we are grateful that we are able to trust in you and not rely on our intellect. The intellect has become a servant to us. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to see you as the God of our strength, our rock, fortress, deliverer, rock, the horn of our salvation, our shield, and our refuge. We call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and you deliver us from our enemies. We consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And we hold on to this proclamation, for you will fulfill the work until the end that you started in us. And whatever we see with our physical eyes, whatever we may feel, we are not going to be based on this. We are based on that which the Word of God says about us. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to worship before you. Hallow you, our Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And to not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with unblemished joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise through Jesus Christ, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>